remember the uh, I was describing that the eye itself is made up of three layers of tunics. All right, and so the middle layer is the one that we were on, and that's the vascular tunic, and aptly named, all right, because there's quite a bit of vascular structures here, all right, and part of the vascular tunic is the iris, and that's, we're all familiar with the iris as being the part that gives color to the eye, all right, and at the center of the iris is the pupil, okay, but the iris is also handy because it divides, okay, the anterior, uh, cavity into uh, two smaller compartments, which we call the anterior and posterior chamber. And we'll talk about, well, I'll talk about it right now. But what you need to understand about the iris is one, it has the melanocytes. That's important for a couple of reasons. One, it gives us the color to our eye, okay? And it helps with absorbing, you know, stray light, okay? And then we'll also see, all right, obviously the smooth muscle, and we'll talk about the role of the smooth muscle here in a moment because that is going to uh, change the diameter of the uh, pupil, okay? Um, so the iris plays a big role in that it actually will physically divide the anterior cavity into the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So that pretty much, when we talk about the anterior chamber, that's everything in front of the iris, which is going to be, all right, the cornea all the way back to the iris there posterior chamber is going to be from the iris to the lens. Let me just see if I can find a picture of that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I want to show you. All right, so here's the lens. Here's the iris. Here's the cornea, okay? So the anterior chamber is going to be pretty much from the iris to the cornea, so all this right here, all right? And then behind the iris to the lens, all right, that's going to be the posterior chamber. So that includes this space back here, all right, this little bit of area here, all right, and all through here. So that's going to be the posterior chamber. All right, this is going to be important here in a moment because we're going to talk about, all right, uh, the aqueous humor, which is the fluid that circulates through this area here, all right, and that's what helps to oxidize and bathe, all right, the structures here in the lens and here in the cornea, okay? Um, All right, so in the center of our iris is the pupil. That's the opening. Think of it like an aperture if you're into photography. It lets the light in, so to speak, right? In dark conditions, the pupil will be dilated. It'll be really big to let as much light in as possible. And in bright situations, like when you step outside into the direct sunlight, it'll be really small to restrict the amount of light that comes in. So speaking of that, how do we change that diameter of the, of the pupil? All right, we have two groups of muscles, all right? We've got the sphincter pupillae muscle. And remember, what we learned when we were studying chapter 11, all right, in lab, sphincter muscles make an opening smaller, okay? Orbicularis oris, orbicularis oculi, those are sphincter muscles, and they make the openings to the mouth and the actual orbit smaller, okay? So the sphincter pupillae muscle, all right, is going to constrict the pupil. All right, it'll make it smaller, all right? Well, we knew this from lecture that it's under parasympathetic nervous system control. Specifically, and you should know this, cranial nerve number three, which is ocular motor, right, which makes sense because we know the four cranial nerves, I hope you all remember the four cranial nerves that are part of the parasympathetic nervous system, the numbers, three, seven, nine and 10, ocular motor, facial, glossopharyngeal, vagus. Remember another name for the parasympathetic diversion, diversion, division is known as the cranial sacral division, right? Cranial implies the four cranial nerves, three, seven, nine, and 10, okay? So then, all right, we have the other muscle group is called the dilator pupillae muscle. Well, that's easy because it tells you exactly what it does, all right? So it's going to make the opening the pupil bigger, okay? And so it is operated by the sympathetic nervous system, all right? So you have this reflex, and you guys go to the doctor in which they'll do this. If you've ever had to go into the room and they shine a light into your eye, all right? They are checking two cranial nerves, cranial nerve number two, this cranial number two is the optic nerve, and so that's where all that 
photoreceptor information goes and travels on, all right? And then it's going to affect what happens when someone shines a light in your eye. The pupil gets smaller. It constricts, all right? And so we know now, because we just went over it, the, the, the constrictor pupillae muscle is innervated by cranial nerve number three. So two and three, okay? That's what we're doing when we're checking the pupillary reflex. All right, we're going to see that constriction there. All right, so that's what it looks like here. All right, when we're looking at the bright light being shined into your eye, all right, we get constriction of the pupillary, or excuse me, of the pupil. All right, and you can see here's the sphincter muscles, the circular smooth muscle group here. And it constricts, winds down, all right, parasympathetic nervous system. Which cranial nerve? Three, right, cranial nerve number three. All right, now you're in a dark room, there's hardly any light, okay, the pupil gets bigger, okay, so we want to get bigger to let as much light in as possible, if any, and that is going to be stimulated by sympathetic innervation, and that's going to be the dilator pupillae muscles, which are these muscles out here on the periphery, okay? So they're going to contract, pulling this inner ring further away from the center, giving you a big pupil, okay? All righty. So let's go into the inner layer, the last of the tunics, the retina. Okay, you've probably heard of this before. People have had detached retinas and different issues, okay? So the retina has a couple layers to it, all right? We've got the pigmented layer. So we're, whenever you see pigmented anything, when you're dealing with the eye, you should immediately start to think of melanocytes or somewhere in there, all right? And this layer, its job, all right, a couple things, one, it's going to prevent light from scattering because it's going to absorb it. You can't just have light bouncing around. I'm not going to get into physics here. But light has um, two properties to it. It has uh, a wave property to it, and then it has a particle property. They call them photons, all right? So those photons have a tendency to scatter. They just shoot around like ping bouncing random ping pong balls in this room here off the tile, all right? So that's what photons would do. Well, the pigmented layer is going to absorb those stray photons, right? So it doesn't mess up your image that you're seeing. Also, right, vitamin A is huge, okay, for our photoreceptors. Rhodopsin, all right, we'll talk about that, okay, for the photoreceptors. We need vitamin A to make this stuff, okay? So we'll get into that in, uh, in lecture, right? Then we have our neural layer, right? Obviously, that implies that we're going to be dealing with neurons, right? So we're going to have photoreceptors, okay? That's that receptor I was telling you about. It's going to pick up the light stimuli, right? And then we're also going to be discussing all the different types of cells and neurons involved in that, okay? And I'll show you a picture here in a few moments. And then we've got this other structure called the aura serrata, or serrata, I think serrated edge. All right, this structure has a jagged like edge, but this is where we're going to see. It's a boundary all right, between the areas where we have photosensitivity and parts that have no photosensitivity. It means we, we just don't have, in certain areas of your eyeball and the internal portion, you've got places where there's photoreceptors and you have places where there aren't any. Okay? And so we'll see all right, that a lot of the non photosensitive areas are going to be in the front portion of your eyeball, which makes sense. Right, because the light's going to go in and hit the back portion of your eyeball. Right? That's where you want all the photoreceptors. I don't want them up front. Okay? All right. So let's talk about some of these layers in the neural layer all right, of the retina. Okay? There's three layers. All right? We've got our photoreceptor layer, our bipolar cell layer, and the ganglion cell layer. Okay? So now this is interesting to me because all right, you would assume that the innermost layer of your retina is where the photoreceptors would be. They're not. They're the outermost layer. Keep that in mind. They are the outermost layer. Light does not hit that layer first. When it enters into your eyeball, it hits this layer, the ganglion cell layer. That's the innermost layer all right, when we're talking about the retina. So here, if I show you, I'll come right back to this picture. You can see how light all right, enters into the eyeball let me go to this picture real fast, okay? So light enters into the eye, all right? And then it's gonna hit 
the retina back here. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a chunk out of the retina here. And that's what this is. Okay, so this is on the inside of the eyeball. But look here at that first layer. This is the ganglion cell layer. Then we have another layer of cells, the bipolar layer of cells. And then finally, we have the photoreceptor layer of cells. Okay, so light is going to hit these other two layers and then eventually hit the photoreceptor cell. So it's got to pass through two other layers of cells first, hits the photoreceptor cell layer, and then it's going to trigger some sort of reaction. We'll go into that, which will then we'll start to get our, our nerve signal response. All right, and it'll start here in the photoreceptor cells, then go into the bipolar uh, layer of cells, and then out to the ganglion uh, layer of cells, and then eventually out to the optic nerve. All right, but we'll, we'll hit all that. But it's just it's an interesting kind of scenario there in which um, the photoreceptors are the last layer to actually uh, receive the light. Okay, so when we're talking about photoreceptors, we have two types: rods and cones. All right, cones begin with the C, color begins with the C. So it's the cone cells that give us color. There's only three types of color. Each cone cell is specific for one of the primary colors. Okay, you all remember what the primary colors are? The wheel. Yeah, yeah. Red, blue, and yellow are going to be the primary colors. Okay, because if you think about it, you can make all the other colors from those three colors. Blue and right, blue and yellow is green. Red and blue is purple. Okay. Oh, and red and yellow is orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get all the others. Okay. Anyways, um, and then the rods are going to be more for low light scenario. Okay, we'll talk more about that. Okay, so this is the layer that's going to react to the light. All right. So then the bipolar cell, remember a bipolar cell is a cell that has a cell body and then it's got two processes, one going off one way, one going off the other. One of those processes is the axon. The other one is the dendrite. Okay, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so that's what we're going to see. So the dendrite end of those bipolar cells is going to receive any input from the photoreceptor cells. All right, and then it's going to transmit possibly that information to the next layer, which is the ganglion cell layer. Okay, and it's eventually the ganglion cell layer, their axons are going to form the optic nerve. Okay, and this is where we'll start to generate our action potentials. All right, we can talk about all that fun stuff in lecture. All right, and then intermixed between these cell layers, between the photoreceptor cell layer and the bipolar cell layer, you have what's are, what are called horizontal cells. Okay, and they're going to have a regulatory role. Okay, as to what happens between the photoreceptor cells and the bipolar cells. And then between the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells, that's where you have the amacrine cells. And again, they have a regulatory role, all right, that is going to occur, and then we're going to see action potential uh, production there, okay? Again, we'll hit all this stuff when we hit um, in lecture. Okay, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction there. Okay, so here you, again, you can see all those different cells, all right? Here are your photoreceptors, the bipolar cells, and then the ganglion cells, then you can see all right, here are your horizontal cells, and, they're, and we call them that because they have a horizontal configuration here in this cell layer. And then further down, we got the amacrine cells here, okay? All right, so a couple of things that you will notice here on the retina, all right, are going to be first this structure called the optic disc, otherwise known, you know, as the blind spot. And it's the blind spot because there are no photoreceptors there. Okay, so no images and light will not be able to stimulate anything there because there's nothing for uh, it to get stimulated by, okay? And so, but eventually all of the ganglion axons will head towards the optic disc and then exit out of the eyeball as the optic nerve, okay? And it's going to go towards the brain. All right, not too far from the optic disc, you got this other structure. It's like a ring within a ring, okay? So this outermost portion here, that's the macula luta, okay? And within that, you have this other structure, which is called the fovio centralis, all right? And that is where you have the sharpest vision, okay? Pretty much all cones, all right? Because cones have to do with 
visual acuity and sharpness. Rods, they're not so good, but rod in, 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 they're not so good in regards to how sharp or crisp an image is, but they're great in low light. They're like your night vision, all right, photoreceptors. So there's not a lot of light. Your rods, so like when you wake up out of, at night and you're in your bed and you're, in, in your in the room, there's a little bit of light coming in, your rods are going full blast. They're, you know, they're responsible for that night vision. So you can see shadows and whatnot pretty well. Um, you're utilizing that. But the, the, the cones, not so much, okay? But know that this area, the foveal centralis, that's where you'll have your sharpest vision. That's ideally, when an image is coming into your eye, that's where you want to focus, all right, those light rays on that spot there, okay? And then all to the side, the peripheral portions of the retina, that's pretty much where you're going to find your rods, all right? And they work great when there's not a lot of light, okay? All right. I want to talk to you about the lens, okay? The lens in is for some of us who wear glasses, all right? Our lens in our eye is very similar to the lenses in our glasses or contacts, all right? It is going to change shape. This is what I love. All right, this is an actual organic structure that changes shape, all right, and allows us to focus on an image that we're looking at. It's really kind of cool. So the job of the lens is to focus light. If you've ever used a magnifying glass, all right, to burn something, all right, similar to that, that's the property that we're trying to do. Because when you are able to burn like a leaf, I'm not saying ants because then that would make you a psychopath, all right, um, but if you were burning a leaf or whatever, a piece of paper, you're able to focus those, those light rays on a specific point. And that's what the lens in our eyes, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to focus those light rays, not to burn a hole in our retina, but to get to that, that sharpest image spot there of the foveal centralis. So that's what it does. It focuses the light on the retina here. Okay? So the nice thing about the lens is right, the lens is pretty much transparent. Okay? But at one point, it had a bunch of organelles. They've since gone. All right? And what's left behind is this crystalline protein here, okay? And it allows us to, for light to transmit right through that actual structure there, okay? On the outer surface of the lens, of course, we layer it with a nice dense fibrous, but this is the most important part, elastic capsule, okay? Elastic, so it's capable of changing shape, all right? Because we need to change shape. If I'm looking at something in the distance like the mountains when I'm driving towards Haywood Mall, then I look down at my radio station dashboard there and I need to change the station. I'm changing what I'm looking at. I'm going from, my, from, from a far distance to looking at something that's close. It's called accommodation. I'm going to be shaping, changing the shape of that lens. And it's important that I'm able to do that and that we have these elastic uh, components to allow us to do that. Now, the shape is going to determine this, struct, this term here, light refraction, which is bending the light rays. Okay, that's what the lens does. It's going to bend the light rays. All right, again, we'll get into more of that in lecture. All right, so how we actually change the shape of the lens is dependent upon the ciliary muscle and then the ligaments that attach the ciliary muscle to the lens. Okay, so for that example that I was using, I'm in my car, I'm looking at the mountains far away. All right, here in that situation, the lens is flattened. Okay, it's very flat, so it looks like this. All right, so we're not going to see all right a lot of bending of light rays there. Okay, but when that happens, all right, now this is the craziest thing. Okay, but this is just a pure memorization situation. All right, the ciliary muscle is relaxed, and because of that relaxation of the ciliary muscle it causes the suspensory ligaments to tense up, all right? So with the muscle kind of, I'll try to draw it like, here's my version of it being relaxed, all right? The suspensory ligaments are taut and tight, and when that happens, they pull on the lens, all right? So it's, these are all relaxed, all right? And so these ligaments yank on the lens and stretch it out, okay? Now, Someone's calling you on your phone, but yet you're smart enough to where you don't have your phone all right, in your hand. You have it on the phone holder on your dashboard. And you look from those mountains to the phone holder there, and you're like, oh, that's Barb. I don't want to talk to her, all right, or Karen, 
And I don't want to talk to any of those people. So what do we do? What happens now, all right, now the lens becomes more spherical. It goes from that thin to this big fat configuration like that. All right, now that's going to be bending some light rays, okay? But what caused that to happen was the ciliary muscle contracted and became tight, but that causes the suspensory ligaments to be nice and loose. And so when they're loose, they take tension off of the lens, and the lens can then rebound into its original shape there, all right? And it becomes nice and fat, okay? So when the muscle's tense, the suspensory ligaments are less tense and, and loose, okay? All right, so you've got some fluids in your eye, some goo, all right? And the two chambers of your eye, remember you have the posterior chamber. What's the posterior chamber? Well, that's this part of the eye. Here's your posterior chamber back here, or cavity, excuse me, posterior cavity. And then you have your anterior cavity up here. Well, in the posterior cavity, you have what's called the vitreous humor, all right? That's like a jelly, okay? I like grape jelly. Well, that's what's back there. And in the front, all right, in the anterior cavity, you have the aqueous humor. Aqueous is going to be closer to a uh, liquid, um, okay? So the vitreous humor, believe it or not, is with you, all right, when you are developing inside a mommy, okay? So we refer to it as a permanent fluid there forever, okay? It helps to, because it's like jelly, it helps to give the eye and maintain its shape and that rounded like structure there, all right? And at the same time, that's why to really cause a detached retina is not as easy as one would think, all right? Because that vitreous humor helps to push the retina up against the other tunics of the eye, so it keeps it flat, okay? If you get a detached retina, all right, You've got some stuff going on because it's pulling away from the other tunics there, all right, and the vitreous humor isn't helping to keep it flush against the back of the eye, so that's a problem, all right? So then in the anterior cavity, we have the aqueous humor. Now, this is the one where you hear the term, have you ever heard of uh, glaucoma, all right? The joke always is, this is why I've got to smoke my marijuana for my glaucoma, all right? Well, this is the interesting thing about that gla glaucoma, excuse me, aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is constantly being produced, all right? It's not a permanent, all right? It's not a permanent fluid, all right? This is a continually produced fluid that gets produced, all right, in the posterior chamber, and then it flows through the iris, it flows into the anterior chamber, and then it gets drained out from there, okay? So that'll occur in front of the lens here. But its job, all right, like I said before, is to nourish, but most importantly, it oxygenates the lens and the inside of the cornea here. All right, so here we can see what is the aqueous humor. All right, it's just plasma, comes from the blood, it's filtered from the blood, all right, from the capillary walls of the ciliary process there, starts in the posterior chamber, circulates through the pupil there, all right, of the iris, and then it comes into the anterior chamber and it gets drained out through what we call the sclerovenous sinus. Now, in some situations for certain types of glaucoma, all right, that sinus can get blocked, okay? So we have drugs for that that will help to, to, to repair that, okay? But if we have, there's two types of glaucoma. There's what we call acute angle glaucoma. I can't remember the other one. I want to say open angle. I can't remember the exact... All right. But it all has to do with whatever is blocking the scleral venous sinus. All right. So we have certain drugs that can help with that. Okay. But when we're unable to drain all right, that aqueous humor, then we've got glaucoma. Okay. So let me show you. I like pictures. Here you go. Aqueous humor production starts here all right, by the ciliary processes. All right. So it starts back here in the posterior chamber drains through the uh, uh, pupil here into the anterior chamber, and then it gets drained out here of the scleral venous sinus, these tiny little holes here. Okay, and again, um, depending on what is causing that blockage and inhibiting that, um, uh, the drainage of the aqueous humor will determine what type of uh, glaucoma you have, okay? 
All right, that's it for the eye. Okay, so let's do some labeling. And then we'll say, please. Okay, so we're going to start with some of the external structures and then we'll move to the internal structures here. Okay, so last class we talked about all right, that you have two eyelids, an upper eyelid and a lower eyelid. So, of course, we give them a different name. We don't call them eyelids. We will call the upper eyelid the superior palpebra. Okay. And then we have our lower eyelid. Okay, that is going to be called the inferior palpebra. Now that opening between the two eyelids is the palpebral fissure. Okay, you don't have to know that, but we talked about it last class. Right? But where the superior palpebra and the inferior palpebra, where they meet together, okay, where they come together on the, on the medial side here, all right, we call that the medial canthus, or you can call it the medial commissure. Okay, so it's where the two eyelids will meet on the medial portion of the eye. It's the medial canthus or the medial commissure. All right, and then where they come together, you can guess what that's going to be called on the lateral portion. That's the lateral canthus or the lateral commissure. Okay, so now we've got a covering that you can see that covers your eye here. And the part that covers the sclera or the white of your eye, we call that the ocular conjunctiva. All right, the ocular conjunctiva, that is that clear covering of the white portion of your eye. All right, and that's the sclera. So what is, an, what do we call the itis? Conjunctivitis. No. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to flip our model and we're going to look at it from the inside. Remember, the ocular conjunctiva covers the eye, but also the conjunctiva will cover the inside of the eyelid. All right, and so we refer to that as the palpebral conjunctiva. Okay, that'll be that lining on the inside, represented by this pink. It looks pink to me, pink or peach or whatever. Okay. All right, so then you'll see we have these yellowish lines here, and those represent, all right, what we call the tarsal glands. So these little lines here. We talk about their role, okay? They help to lubricate the eye, provide some defenses for the eye, certain enzymes that kill things off, all right? Microbes and whatnot. Importantly though, that the, the uh, secretions there help to oxygenate, all right, the tissue there. All right, so those are the tarsal glands there. All righty. So we've got a gland. Speaking of glands, we've got this big honker over here. That's the lacrimal gland. Okay, the lacrimal gland is going to provide lacrimal fluid to the eye. All right, now the lacrimal gland is innervated by a cranial nerve. Does anybody remember which cranial nerve? This one's seven. Cranial nerve seven. Facial. Yep. Facial is going to innervate, all right, the lacrimal gland. All right, and then it's tough to see from here, all right, but you have these ducts that come off. Let me see if I can find it on the other one. Right. Yeah, I think it's easier to see it here. I'll zoom in on them. Okay, so you can see these little gray lines here, all right, right there. This one, it's, this slide's not that great for that. Well, you guys, you can kind of see them right here. Right here, the arrows are actually covering them. 
right? But those are your lacrimal gland ducts. All right, so the lacrimal gland supplies the lacrimal fluid, all right, that gets washed across the eye as you're blinking, okay? And then eventually, it'll collect over here in this pinkish region on the medial portion of your eye. And that's called the lacrimal caruncle, actually caruncle. But if you keep in mind that it's just car and the word uncle all together, you'll never misspell it. So that's the lacrimal caruncle. That's the area of your eye when you wake up in the morning and you got some crusties. That's where they hang out in that region there. Okay, you'll find them. So in close area to the lacrimal caruncle there, you'll see an opening. There's a little black dot here and a little black dot over here. All right? You don't need to know those, but those are called the puncta. Those are the openings to these structures, right? The superior lacrimal canal or the superior lacrimal canuliculi are these tubes that are going to drain the lacrimal fluid from the eye. Can't really see the opening to the superior lacrimal canal, All right? But you can see the one for the inferior lacrimal canal, that little hole there. And so this, these tubes here, all right, are going to drain the lacrimal fluid, all right, into this structure that sits right on the nasal bone, and that's called the lacrimal sac. All right, so the lacrimal sac receives that lacrimal fluid, all right, from the eye. And so from there, all right, the lacrimal fluid drains down into the nasal lacrimal duct. And then eventually the nasal lacrimal duct will empty that fluid into your nose, okay, into the nasal cavity. And I've said this before, now you know why. When you cry, you get a runny nose, all right? Or if your allergies are really bothering you and it's causing your eyes to water, why you get a runny nose, all right? Has anybody's allergies been bothered? Does anyone here have allergies? I thought so, Michael. I can hear you over there. I'm the same way. Do you take anything for them? The, that's what I... It, do you feel like they're helping you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I started taking um, lorantadine, which is Claritin. And I was taking 10 milligrams. I bought it by accident. Did I tell you guys this? I went to Costco. Well, I went to Costco, and I thought my son took this stuff. And it was on sale. I was like, I'm going to buy it. There's like 360 pills in this bottle. It's not that expensive. So I brought it home, and I said, I got some more medication. And my wife's like, that's, no, he doesn't take that. I'm like, 360 pills. We had two bottles of it at the home, and nobody takes this. I was like, you know what? I'm going to start taking it. So I started taking two. So each pill is 10 milligrams. So I'm, I'm taking 20 milligrams. I'm, I don't want to jinx myself, but I'm actually better than I have been in a while. So lorantadine, it's the, the um, and this is not, I'm not advocating. Everyone's different. You know, some people love Zyrtec. I don't think I've ever taken it. But this stuff uh, has helped, at least for me. So this is not a, a public service announcement. I'm not advertising. I don't make any money off of this. Okay. So let's talk about some muscles. Okay, so we have some extrinsic eye muscles, and the one that is the most superior muscle of the extrinsic eye muscles sits on, on top. This muscle tells you exactly what it does. Levator palpebrae superioris. Okay, so it tells you it's going to elevate the eyelid, all right, specifically the upper eyelid. Okay, it opens it up. So if you lesion the nerve to this muscle, you'll get a droopy eye. Right? You'll get ptosis, but ptosis is spelled P-T-O-S-I-S, ptosis. All right, so here's a different angle. You don't have this in your atlas, but you can just kind of see. Here's the lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland is always lateral. Right? You can just see it sits right up here on top. Right? It attaches right onto the superior palpebra there. All right, this one you do have in your book. All right, this is a lateral view. How do I know it's the lateral view? Because I see the lacrimal gland. 
All right, if you can see the lacrimal gland fully, it's the lateral view, okay? So on top here, this top muscle right up here, that's the levator, let me get that out of the way. That's the levator palpebrae superioris right there. Because there's another muscle that sits right below it, all right? And that muscle that sits right below the levator palpebrae superioris helps you to look up towards the sky. Right, and that's the superior rectus. Okay. Superior rectus attaches right here onto the top of your eyeball. Okay. So I'm talking about the superior rectus that's on top. Then we have the inferior rectus that's down below. Okay, so you can't see it very well fully here, okay, but you can see where it is in the back portion. And it's going to travel down and attach onto the bottom of the eye. So when you're looking down toward your feet, you're going to be contracting the inferior rectus muscle. All right, unfortunately, you don't have this picture in your book, all right, but this is just showing you. All right, we've cut away a couple muscles on top there. Okay, we've gotten rid of the levator palpebrae superioris, we've gotten rid of superior rectus. So you can hear, here's the optic nerve right there. All right, and here is part of inferior rectus down here. Do you have that picture in your book? Oh, you do? Oh, cool, cool, cool. That's the next picture that you don't have. All right, this one here. There's the inferior rectus. All right. So now you've got the medial rectus, okay, here. So the medial rectus is if you cross your eyes, if you look in towards your nose, okay. So that's the medial rectus. It pulls your eye inward. Okay. Here's lateral rectus. Again, look to see where the lacrimal gland is. If you can see it fully, all right, and the muscle that's right next to it, that is going to be your lateral rectus. This is going to allow your eyeball to move out toward looking toward your ear. Okay, and then you got two other muscles, and they're, they're special muscles, all right? So we add in a special name for them. All right, superior oblique muscle, it's up here in the corner. Okay, so when you're looking at your eye from the front, okay, on top you've got the superior rectus muscle, SR. On the medial portion here, you've got medial rectus, MR. On the bottom, you've got inferior rectus, IR. And then over here on the outside in the lateral portion, you've got the lateral rectus, LR. All right, so then you've got a muscle here in this corner, and then another muscle down here in this corner. So the one in this corner, that's superior oblique. That's what we're seeing here on this picture. And then the next one, this is inferior oblique, all right, and that's what we'll see here. So the inferior oblique muscle attaches onto, all right, the underside of the eye. All right, let me just stop this for one second. And pull this one slide up. I should have done this. I don't know. My slides are out of order. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I didn't show you these real quick, so I'm just going to kind of show you now. All right, so here you can see, all right, there's superior rectus, how it attaches onto the top of the eye. This is a lateral view, by the way. Here's lateral rectus on the side. Here's the inferior rectus coming down and attaching on the underside. 
So you got the superior oblique muscle. And if you look closely here, it travels, so you can see the tendon travels through this little kind of ring-like structure. All right, that's called the trochlea. It means pulley. All right, well, and then you can see how the tendon comes through, and then it attaches on to the upper corner, but on the outside of the eye. Okay? So when the eyeball contracts, or when the eyeball contracts, when the superior oblique muscle contracts, it's going to pull the eye up, but at the same time, your eyeball is going to look down and out, down and out away. Okay? This muscle superior oblique is innervated by, all right, the fourth cranial nerve, the trochlea nerve. That means pulley, all right? Um, here is the medial view here. Okay, same thing. You can see, all right, some of the muscles here and their attachment points. And then you can see the muscles as how they would appear in the orbit here without the eye, uh, the eyeball actually. Okay, so you can see here's the superior, or excuse me, uh, superior oblique attaching to the outer portion. Inferior rectus does the same thing, but it wraps around a little bit more on the underside. But they both originate on the medial portion here of the orbit. Okay. And then finally, here it is from a superior view looking down. So the same thing you can kind of see here. Here's superior oblique and its attachment site. And then you can see how inferior oblique wraps on the underside here of the eye. All right. I thought I showed you those, but I didn't. Okay. Now, oh. All right. So this little guy here, this little slide here, basically tells you when I was in school, we learned um, an equation um, called, it's very similar, similar to this, LR6 SO4. And then we learned it in parentheses with a 3. Basically, what that means is, all right, lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve number 6. All right, that's abducens. Superior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve number four. Okay, that's trochlea. And then all the remaining muscles of the eye are, is innervated by cranial nerve number three, which is ocular motor. That's what that means. Okay, so that's this. All right, let's go a little bit deeper into the eye here. Let's look at the outermost layer, the fibrous tunic. All right, there's only two structures to the fibrous tunic, but again, the fibrous tunic helps. One, it allows attachment points for muscles and other structures, right? kind of like periosteum does right, for bone. Okay? And it also helps to add to the shape of the eye. So you have two structures, the cornea and the sclera. Now I'll show you each one individually. Okay, so the white of the eye, that's the sclera. Okay. And then the cornea is that clear structure right in front of the pupil and the iris. Not too bad, not too bad. All right, let's go to the next layer or the next tunic. That's the vascular tunic. Again, this slide is just showing you everything that's included in the vascular tunic. All right, iris, pupil, ciliary, body, dispensary, ligaments, lens, cord. I'm going to go through all this individually here, okay? So not to worry, okay? That's just showing you all the components of our vascular tunic. All right, so let's go through each of the individual components now. So we'll start off with the iris, okay? There's the colored portion to your eye. Melanocytes contribute to that color. All right, I'll show you another uh, picture of the iris. Here it is here, okay? Then at the center of our iris is our pupil, right here. And then we'll see it again here, All right? That's that light aperture. Let's light enter in and go into the eye. Now, unfortunately, these next couple of slides you don't have, okay? 
But here is a picture of the ciliary body. So we know that the ciliary body is going to have something to do with the lens. So look for the lens, all right? And then the ciliary body is going to be this structure that kind of hangs, well, hangs down from the superior portion or uh, comes up from the inferior portion. That's the ciliary body, all right? And that's the structure that produces the uh, aqueous humor, okay? Then you can see we have the suspensory ligaments. These are these thin lines that attach here on the lens. They're going to affect the shape of the lens, okay? And then this is the ciliary muscle back in here, okay? Wherever you see any muscle tissue, okay? Again, you don't have to label that. So will we have to write terms? You do, you do. I'll kind of show you on the, I'll show it on, on the, the slide here. There's, I just want to show you here on a, on a good model, and then I can, and I'll try to show you on what they have in the book. All right, and then obviously there's the lens. Okay. Choroid. That's that, uh, I don't know what color that looks like to you, brownish. Okay, with all the blood vessels and nerve fibers running in it. That's the choroid. Okay, so now we're going to go to the final tunic, the neural tunic, the retina, okay? All right, that's the inside here, the innermost layer, okay, where all the stuff happens, okay? The neural tunic, innermost layer here, okay? So we have the retina, macula luta, the fovea centralis, and the optic disc. So let's look at the, each of those individually. Okay, here's the retina. That's like that pinkish, peach-colored, all right, structure, that hole inside there. You see all the blood vessels hanging out there. All right, so again, this is not the best. That's why I like to use those other models, but I'll show you. All right. Here, these little white lines here, those are the suspensory ligaments, here and here, all right? Those are the suspensory ligaments. Or I should say part of the suspensory ligaments, okay? Because the lens sits right in here. We've just removed the lens, okay? So your lens sits here. Those suspensory ligaments hang down from there. All right, and they attach onto the lens. Okay, so the ciliary body is going to be in here. Okay, here, here. That's going to be the ciliary body. All right, like I said, these models aren't the best for those structures. Okay, I do believe you have this though. There's the retina. All right, and then this actually is a, a view from an ophthalmoscope. So this is when the doctor is actually looking in your eye. Right, and they shine that light in your eye. This is what they're looking at. So the retina has kind of like an orangish, yellowish, hue to it. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. All this is the retina. All right, then if you look close, remember I told you, you have a ring inside of a ring. So the outermost portion, the first ring, the outermost ring, that's the macula luta. And then that little dot on the inside, I'll show you. Uh, I won't show you on this. All right, so that blue kind of circle that I drew, that's the macula luta. And this little dot on the inside there, all right, that's the fovea centralis. That's where you have that high concentration of cones there for the sharpness of vision. All right, so it's kind of hard to see, but there is a ring that goes around that little yellow dot. You can see it better here on the ophthalmoscope one. So 
That's the macula luta, but you can definitely see at the center there, there's that little dot there. That's the fovea centralis. And then you can see where all these blood vessels are converging on one point, okay? If they're veins, okay, they're exiting. If they're arteries, they're entering, okay? But all this stuff is going to enter and exit the eye itself at this spot. That's the optic disc, okay? The optic disc is where the nerves and the blood vessels enter and exit from the eye. All right, you can see it here on your model, right there. All right, you have no photoreceptors there, okay? No photoreceptors. That's just where everything is coming in and leaving the eyes, right there at the optic disc. Don't confuse that with the fovea centralis, okay? You also can see it here on this model. There it is. Okay, so speaking of nerves, boom, there should be, there's cranial nerve number two, optic nerve. All right, that's where all the axons from those ganglion cells will converge and exit the eye. That's going to head back towards the brain. All right, we're almost done here. Let's just talk about some of the space inside of the eye. Remember, you have those two cavities. You have the posterior and the anterior cavity. Posterior cavity is the larger of the two. All right, that's everything behind the lens. Okay, so remember, our lens is supposed to be here. All right, so that posterior cavity is this whole thing where I'm placing this X. That's the posterior cavity. Posterior cavity is filled with that vitreous humor, right? You've got a picture of it here. Vitreous humor is that permanent substance that sits in the posterior cavity, right? Helps to keep the retina, remember, up against or flush against the wall of the eye, right? It also helps to maintain the shape of the eye. Okay, so that's it for the posterior cavity. Let's move on to the anterior cavity. That's that cavity in front of the lens. All right, so again, I'm gonna draw the lens in here. Okay, so pretty much all of this is the anterior chamber, or excuse me, anterior cavity. And that's filled with the aqueous humor. Okay, remember our aqueous humor, okay, gets produced by the ciliary body, right, gets produced by the ciliary body here, and then it flows through the pupil in here. Okay. So, kind of showing you here, when we're talking about the anterior cavity, all right, that's pretty much from the lens to the cornea. So all of this. All right, so the anterior cavity is divided into two chambers. You have the posterior and you have the anterior. So here's the posterior chamber. Okay, we're just showing you, all right, that the posterior chamber is from the lens, ciliary body. Sometimes they expand it back here where the suspensory ligaments are, all right? But that's going to be behind the pupil in the iris, okay? And then you have the anterior right here. It's from the pupil or the front of the iris to the cornea. And that's the anterior chamber. And that concludes the eye. That's it. It's a lot. Okay, but some of those terms you already knew. Pupil, cornea, lens, retina, okay. All right, 